Let's talk about insulin and how it works, plus some pharmacology. Here's everything we'll talk about. Timestamps are down below and a short quiz at the end. To truly understand insulin, we have to do a quick overview. There is a lot of moving pieces anytime you talk about insulin. So bear with me for a couple minutes. Let's go through the overview and then we can dive in a little deeper. So the first thing we need to know is there are different types of insulin. We're going to focus on rapid acting insulin, regular insulin, the intermediate insulin, and long acting insulins. You also need to know that insulin comes in an injectable dosage form. Anytime you're using insulin, it's always going to require a syringe or a pen needle because it's all injectable. Specifically, we use it as a sub-Q injection or subcutaneous injection, and that is right under the skin in the cutaneous fat. That's where it gets absorbed. The next thing we need to know is insulin is used for type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Anytime you use insulin, we require the insulin to do two things. We want to lower our blood glucose levels in these patients, and we want to have the insulin available to allow the cells to use that glucose for energy. We'll talk about this in a little bit more detail, but in general, we use insulin for both type 1 and type 2 diabetes medication management. Now that we have a general overview, let's dig into seeing how insulin actually works. Well, insulin is actually a hormone, and it's actually released from the pancreas into your bloodstream. And the way it works is when you have glucose in your blood from either eating cookies or your liver creating and releasing glucose into your bloodstream, your pancreas notices and starts to push out insulin. The goal of insulin is to couple with the glucose to allow the glucose to enter our tissues and cells, and that's what gives our tissues and cells the energy that they need. You need both the glucose and the insulin to give our tissues and cells energy. So now we have to understand why would a patient need insulin if your pancreas just creates insulin naturally? Well, we have to look into type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes specifically. So for our type 1 diabetic patients, they are typically born with diabetes. It's an autoimmune damage to their pancreas, meaning their pancreas isn't producing insulin. So one thing we can do for these patients is to give them insulin exogenously. Type 2 diabetes is a little different. In these patients, their pancreas works no problem. Their pancreas is producing insulin, but their body has become resistant to insulin because there's been so much glucose in their bloodstream. Over the years, the cells require more insulin to overcome the resistance. But regardless of type 1 or type 2 diabetes, you can use insulin for both. And the way it works, very straightforward. The patient draws up the insulin. They inject it sub-Q, either on the back of the arm or the abdomen. And that insulin slowly absorbs into the bloodstream. So now you have more insulin in the bloodstream to be used to allow glucose to get into your cells. So when would we use insulin? We already talked about this. We use it in our type 1 diabetic patients, and it's the first line of therapy for type 1. If a patient has type 1 diabetes, it means their pancreas is not functioning, their pancreas is not delivering insulin to the bloodstream. So to fix that, we have to give insulin. We can also use insulin for type 2 diabetes. This is different. This is not first line. If a patient is a type 2 diabetic, insulin is your last line of defense. The reason? Because your body is resistant to insulin. So we have a couple other options before you get to insulin. Remember, type 2 diabetic patients have a functioning pancreas. They have insulin being produced. The problem, that the insulin is not enough. They're resistant 
to insulin. So to overcome that, we can give them more insulin, but at that stage, it's last line. Now we can talk about the actual dosing of insulin. I won't lie, this will be the more difficult part, but we'll do a very high level overview on this because you don't need to be bogged down by all the details. You need to know there are four categories. We have our rapid acting insulin, our regular insulin, our intermediate insulin, and then our long acting insulin. And we use these in different ways. Starting with our rapid acting, as the name suggests, these work super fast. And we have two primary insulins. We have insulin Aspart, which is Novolog, or insulin Lispro, which is Humalog. And the brand name ends in log, which really means it's an analog of insulin, which is a good way to remember that it's a rapid acting insulin. If you look at the onset, after a sub-Q injection, it only takes 10 to 15 minutes for it to start working. And the peak is in an hour to three hours. And the duration of the insulin is very short, anywhere from three to five hours. And if you're a visual learner, this is what it kind of looks like on the graph. But the big thing is you take this up to three times a day with food. It's something called a preprandial insulin. That's a fancy way of saying before you eat insulin. So anytime you eat, you take this 10 to 15 minutes prior so that it could cover your glucose intake. Our next option is our regular insulin. And this is the most close to natural insulin as you can get. It's literally called insulin regular. And there's two brands, Humalin R, Novalin R, and the R is for regular. The onset it's a little bit slower, 20 to 30 minutes, but still relatively fast. The peak a little bit further in one and a half to three and a half hours. And then we have our duration five to eight hours. And this is what the absorption graph looks like. Again, you can take this up to three times a day with food. Again, it's a preprandial insulin. So before you eat, you take this insulin to cover your meal. Our next insulin is our intermediate insulin. This is insulin NPH, also known as Humulin N, Novalin N. As the name suggests, these take longer to work, but they also last longer. This insulin is cloudy insulin. And if you look at the vial, you'll see the cloudiness separate from the clear part. You need to roll this insulin between your palms gently. You never want to shake insulin. And the reason for that is because it's a protein and you don't want to break up the protein. You want to keep the insulin intact. The onset takes anywhere from two to four hours for it to work with a longer peak time. And the duration is anywhere from eight to 12 hours. Here's the graph to show the absorption. And because of the way it absorbs, it's usually dosed daily or BID twice a day. This is a type of insulin called a basal insulin. This is our first insulin that is not required with a meal because it's a basal insulin. Another way of saying basal insulin is like a baseline of maintenance insulin. And you use this basically to cover you throughout the day, but you don't use this alone. Typically, you use a preprandial insulin with a basal insulin. Our last category is our long-acting insulin. Here we have two. We have our insulin glargine, or Lantus, and then our insulin Detamir, brand name Levamir. Both of these brand names start with the letter L. That'll hint to you that it's a long-acting insulin. The onset, anywhere from two to four hours. The peak is virtually non-existent. And the duration is anywhere from 18 to 24 hours. So the graph kind of looks like this. And because of that, it's usually a daily dose or a twice a day dose. And you can imagine it's a basal insulin again. This is a baseline insulin. This is to cover you throughout the day. So one way to look at this, it's a lot of information, is you have your preprandial insulins that you take before your meals. 
And then you also have your basal insulin, which is what you take once or twice a day to cover you for that day. I do want to touch on some key points for the preprandial insulin, which we know is our rapid and our regular. If you skip a meal, you skip a dose. You do not take these insulins without a proper meal. All of these insulins, we said earlier, they're injectables, right? They can either come in a vial with a syringe, or they can come in these fancy pens that you can basically change the dose, put a little needle on there, and then inject. Those are usually more expensive, but they're both injectable dosage forms. And now let's talk about the dosing. Insulin dosing is highly variable. It depends on the patient. It depends what they consume. How strict are they to their carb diet, right? Because are they eating 20 grams of carbs with each meal? Is it fluctuating to 60 grams? It matters because it changes how much insulin you need. A very baseline way to start a regimen is to look at your total daily dose requirement. And all you do is you take 0.5 units per kilo, and then you have your total daily dose. You take your total daily dose and you divide it into two parts. You divide it into your preprandial dose and then your basal dose. So let's say you have a 100 kilo patient. That comes out to 50 units a day. 25 units should be for preprandial. 25 units should be your basal. And the gold standard for administering and adjusting a dose of insulin is a patient has to take their blood glucose levels after their meal to see if their glucose covered that meal. There is a lot of information when it comes to insulin. We covered a lot, but trust me, there is a lot more to cover anytime you talk about insulin. But just take this lesson as your first baseline lesson, and then maybe in future videos, we can go into more detail. Let's talk about side effects. This part's a lot easier. So the first thing you need to worry about is hypoglycemia. That means you have a low blood sugar, and that makes sense. You're putting insulin into your body, and if you put too much insulin, that means your glucose levels are going to tank. They're going to go down. And if you have hypoglycemia, a patient can start shivering and then passing out because of the hypoglycemia. The second thing, unfortunately, patients start seeing weight gain. Insulin, we said it's a hormone, but unfortunately, this hormone has a process for administering and moving around adipose tissue. So insulin has a role in adipose tissue development and movement. And because of that, we see weight gain when we introduce more insulin to someone's body. All right, we made it to the end. Let's do a quick summary and then a short quiz. We talked about insulin. We said how they work in type 1 and type 2 diabetes. We talked about how the insulin is an injectable, right? Specifically a subcutaneous injectable. We talked about the pancreas and how the pancreas should be releasing insulin. But in our type 1 and our type 2 diabetes patients, we either need insulin because the pancreas isn't working or we have a resistance to insulin. So we need to add more insulin to overcome the resistance. We talked about our four categories of insulin in detail. We said we had our rapid acting, which works super fast, and our regular acting, which is still relatively fast. Both of these were preprandial insulins because you take them before you eat. And then we have our intermediate and our long-acting insulins, which take longer to work, but they cover you for a longer period of time. Because of that, they're known as our basal insulin or a baseline insulin. And then we got into our side effects. So we talked about how insulin can cause hypoglycemia if used in excess, and then also weight gain. So now let's take a short quiz to see what we retained. Question one, which one of these insulins are considered a preprandial insulin? Question two, true or false, insulin is first-line therapy for type 2 diabetes. 
Question three, which side effect can we see with insulin use? Question four, which of these insulins have the slowest effect? 